Well, howdy out there, friends, and thanks again for joining us here on Expand the Perspectives. It's me, Cam Hale, and uh, sitting across the table from me, as always, I introduce him every time. And uh, now, uh, the elite listeners heard this. Now, he's got another one in here. Uh, the man that likes to power through LaCroix sparkling water... Kyle Filio Filson. How's it going, everybody? Yes, I'm glad to be here. I am drinking another can of LaCroix uh, sparkling water. I mentioned it on the Elite Show. For you Elite members, you were laughing about that, uh, all the crazy flavors they have. Uh, this one is <laughs> apple cranberry again. I'm, I'm really digging these things, man. I, it, my daughter, like I said, my daughter loves uh, the LaCroix. She keeps them around the house and all that stuff. Now, look, she's 17. She has her things, and you know. Everything designed for so, I, but I sneak them like I slip in there when she ain't looking. Get them out of the fridge, yeah. And that go. usually starts a, a heck of a fight. But now I am no longer a single father. Uh, her mother has returned after nine days abroad. She showed back up, went for five days. I never heard from her. So, but she's alive. She survived her. She trip. survived. Yep. And even more survived. shocking, returned home to live with Cam. Yeah, she decided to come back. I think she came back for the girl, not for me. Uh, she brought gifts. I've got. She brought like chocolate and some cigars, and she's got some cool stuff she brought back. So ayahuasca, she had a great time. Perhaps. Ayahuasca had a bunch <laughs> of ayahuasca, some DMT. Yeah, we got all. Uh, we got the teacher vines in the house now. I'm gonna. I'm brewing them as we speak to make a little. Uh, a little tea, but no, everything is good. It feels, I say that, it feels back in normal. She's fixed to go out of town again for another four days for work. So yeah, it's, my house is quiet. It just, you know, like when you unplug a gear, something doesn't seem to work right. So I know exactly what you're talking about. We um, had an unforeseen event on Saturday. Caleb, a uh, buddy of his was having a birthday party, wanted to know if he could come. Of course he could. Then they asked if he could stay the night. It's like, hey, as long as it's okay with his dad. Yeah, whatever. They can. So that happened. Then we went to a, a Delee's grandmother's birthday, and one of the cousins wanted to know if Jacob could spend the night. So we didn't even know it, but Saturday night we had the house all to ourselves, just me and the wife and Luke. And I know what you're talking about. Like three hours in, it like starts to feel a little weird because you're like, man, it is super quiet around here. You catch here. yourself going, what are they up to? And then you're like, oh, they're not here. Yeah, all day long, <laughs> like at the other party we went to, I kept looking for Caleb. I caught myself like four times looking for him. Like, where's Caleb? Oh, yeah, we didn't even bring him. The junior wife party hard, just like two adults. She went to bed early and Luke yeah, went did. to bed and you just sat around watching TV. We, no, we, we got home. <laughs> we got home about eight o'clock at night. We watched, what did we rent? We rented Jigsaw. I'm yeah. not a big fan of the genre, but my wife likes yeah, horror movies. Yeah, we all know she loves horror movies. And uh, it was a lot better than The Snowman. So, she yeah, wakes we watched up beside the, uh, a horror show. So. <laughs> <laughs> we watched The Jigsaw, and then she went to bed, and I, what did I do? Oh, I went and uh, watched uh, two or three more episodes of Black Sails. Like a couple of real, just lovers, wild and crazy lovers going to bed hours apart. <laughs> just like, <laughs> yeah, well, when you've been together for like 14, 15 years, I mean, yeah. you know. She doesn't want you anywhere around her, yeah, and that's fine. I just like my my space a little, <laughs> right? Just but I uh, I have been watching that new that series. It's not new; it's new to me. Black Sails. It's already yeah. ha came and gone. It's over. They don't even make it anymore. <laughs> uh, what happened was I uh, canceled HBO recently because uh, we just haven't been watching things. They don't update their movies very often. Nah, it's not worth it. And so what I did was I canceled HBO and then I signed up for Stars because I've had Stars in the past, but just haven't had it in about three years. Well, and I like it because you could go to your your like your Apple TV or whatnot. Yeah, and click exactly on what it and I just did. Go, I just, that's the only channel I want. Let me see what's Well, on I will here. say this. I, it is on the Apple TV, but I can't watch it on there because, look, folks, if if you like pirates and stuff, you're going to like Black Sails, but it is not appropriate for children. I mean, it's almost like a pornography. It's a porno film, and then some pirate stuff breaks out. I mean, there is a lot. What are you talking about? <laughs> you, there's a lot of nudity in that I don't show. Even, I don't watch that kind of... I don't even... What is this pornography that you speak of? Yeah. I thought Game of Thrones was a little risque, but uh, Black Sails takes it to another level. So... And that green-eyed girl in there is hotter than new love. I go and I watch it on my computer with my headphones on. I bet you do. <laughs> I bet you do. I knew you were going to say something. Yeah, do you watch it by yourself in a closet, too? Uh, yeah. How'd you like, know? I'm going to go to the bathroom and just, uh, I don't know, <laughs> clean my shoes. Is that what... Yeah. That's exactly... Yeah, I know how you watch. It, you nasty son of a I'm, uh, I'm already No wonder she went to bed early without you. She's like, oh, so disgusted. You're watching Black Sails again? You've watched it like four Why times. Why are you sitting around in your underwear watching <laughs> Black Sails with your laptop, your headphones on? <laughs> Don't look at me! Yeah. <laughs> but it's a pretty good show. I like the idea of, you know. Pirates and yeah, stealing yeah, stuff? Yeah. Would. I like that era for whatever reason. Uh, we mentioned it. Lawlessness? Lawlessness. <laughs> yeah, right? It's it's pretty crazy. Well, or speak. the rum. Which one is your Oh, yeah, right? <laughs> Speaking of ancient times, this is a pretty interesting article. Um, you know, for a long time, archaeologists believed that Homo sapiens originated in the continent of Africa, mm -hmm. 
and then slowly made their expansion out into Europe and into Asia, yeah. and then eventually over to North and South America. They thought that happened around 60,000 years ago, but they say that that clever little story that they've been telling people in school for the last couple hundred years, it's starting not to hold up anymore. They say that- How long has school been around that you've been going to? <laughs> for a couple hundred years? Whoa. For, they've been telling school. people that in school, not me. Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, you know, they've been accumulating evidence over the last couple of years that seems to be changing the mm -hmm. history of human origins. And I, they recently discovered something else. The, uh, a guy named Israel Herskovitz from the Tel Aviv University, he published a paper recently in Science Magazine where him and an uh, international team of researchers, they found some new evidence that Homo sapiens actually left Africa tens of thousands of years earlier than what scientists originally thought. Now, the researchers actually found a jawbone and they found this in a collapsed Mislea cave in Israel's Mount Carmel, as and it's a fossil of a Homo sapien jawbone, and it's exhibiting the characteristics, they say, of everything that a modern human has. So they know it's a modern hum Homo sapien, and they've dated the fossil, and it's between 177,000 and 194,000 years, making it the earliest fossil of a modern human found outside of africa wow so it's changing it's pushing it back more they're saying that not homo sapiens probably didn't originate i mean they may have originated not in just africa but other places as well and they were migrating far earlier than what they thought and then this they say this group of caves these are prehistoric caves found on mount carmel in israel it was discovered decades ago but they've only recently been able to have the technology to i guess date these bones and th when this thing collapsed they started doing excavations in there and they found it. They found all kinds of new little trinkets and little, uh, you know, like uh, arrowheads and knives beads. and beads and things like that. And then that's when they found this jawbone. Then they discovered the jawbone back in 2002. And he said that's when they started looking into it. And they've realized that they think now they have a better idea of what's going on. And it's not just Dr. Herskovitz and some of his colleagues, but many people think that Homo sapiens. They were not just in Africa. They were in Asia, Europe, Africa, and along with other hominids. It wasn't like mm -hmm. a linear progression. There was hominids and homo sapiens, and they were interbreeding as well. And so some, it, it they branches were falling off. off. Yeah, they were dropping off, and, and some bloodlines died, some strains. Yeah. Right, so like Neanderthals, mm -hmm. Australopithecus. Um, the giants. The giants, the hominids, all these things, they think that they probably overlapped each other in existence. But this is a homo sapien, so this is just like me and you. It has the same jaw structure as a modern human being, and it's approaching 200,000 years old. That's so pretty wild. what if there's somebody older than that? Oh, I guess they're kids. Well, we'll but, maybe but, we'll find it. But, you but know, that's a long time ago. That's a long ago, time. Right and there. But when you were kids, I mean, when we, you were kids, when we were kids, no one ever thought no. that human beings were around 200,000 years no. ago. No. I mean, I no. think the, the average person on the street now wouldn't believe it if you told them. They um they actually they also talk about in the article that they found something in Morocco a couple of years ago. Now they're not a hundred percent sure because they're still doing DNA and mm -hmm. stuff testing on these bones, but they found some bones, and they say that it exceeds three hundred thousand years. That's what the early tests are showing. Now I do know that they're talking like you said that it's got the the modern Homo sapien jawline. I do know that there's some other tests where they're running on trying to find out when the round let's say like brain pan in the human skull changed because the skulls were even different that they had the same maybe jaw structure but the brain cavity was different in the way it holds in the skull so that they could see a progression like you could tell it's homo sapien but there's a little something different about them well that's what they think they think that they they if homo sapiens did originate in africa they're mm -hmm. not sure that they did but if they did they said they were moving and expanding much earlier than we thought they were and they were migrating at different times than we thought they were, and that they were continuing to exchange their genetic material with other hominids. Yeah. So. We really are just melting pot is all we exactly, are. We're just what happened to just strain out over the years. Which is exactly why, like, racism and stuff is so stupid. Yeah. Because we're all a melting pot of different hominids from different parts <laughs> of the world. Exactly you know what I mean? Same, yes. So, like, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it is. It is ridiculous. It's, it's totally ridiculous. I was just listening to another show. I uh, can't even remember the name of it, but there was a guy on there, and he was talking about it. He's like, I think if if everybody was black, then, then there would be, like, people picking on tall people versus short people. Or he was like, if everybody was white. Human beings would be picking on tall people versus short people. That the reason racism exists is because it's like a human condition. It you doesn't think it's matter. It's a tribal condition. You think it's one of those I, where we always look for what's different in people? I think so. I think it's the, the, it's somewhere deep 
in our brains, our, our reptilian brains, that like people don't like other people for whatever reason that don't look like them. And I think and there's has, always people with tribalism. Take it, take it to the max. There's oh, well, always going to be, of course, that's not saying that explains a bunch of redneck hillbillies that, that don't like people, you know, a bunch of, a bunch of people that, uh, that doesn't explain that, but that does explain like a human emotion. Like we try to, well, it's just like the, like patterns of thinking. Like we all, yeah. everyone that's listening to this podcast has been attacked at one point or another, or let's say attacked, laughed at because of the things that you are open to thinking about. I'm sure that people listening to my voice right now has had someone at work or a family member laugh at them because sure. of and pass judgment on them because of what they believe. And I like that. And that's that- a way of, of, of discriminating. That's a, a tribal mentality of if you don't believe like I believe or this. That, and yeah. That's, yeah. I think it's one of those deals that you, it's probably true. We would always, no matter what, we're going to find a way to separate ourselves and cluster up and things like that. Yeah, you're 100 percent right. And why is it that some people, if you have a difference in opinion or a difference in view, that they get mad? I mean, like, yeah, w- I what's know. the difference if me and you have a difference in opinion or someone listening to my voice right now doesn't agree with what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You don't have to get mad. Yeah, it's, it's okay. Not it's okay. No, it's okay it's to have personal. a difference of opinion. Yeah, it, it's so deeply rooted in this tribalism. Like Super Bowl's approaching, you'll see it. Like there's people who yep. are like, die, "I'm a diehard whatever fan." Yeah, and you see people they get so mad that they beat people to death in the stands. Uh, yeah, just because the fans rooting for the other team. I'm like, how ridiculous is that? Yeah, like, people are crazy. We're a crazy. We are bacteria. That's all we are is a crazy bacteria. I think. I think. It, <laughs> I think you're 100 percent right. And you know, you can dream about world peace, and you can listen to John Lennon songs and stuff. But I. The reality is I don't think it's ever going to happen. I don't think it is. There's something definitely deeply flawed with human beings. You know why? Because <laughs> there's a saying where you just try to be nice. You yeah. shouldn't have to try. Yeah. You should just be nice. <laughs> but we have to try to be nice. Yeah, Every but- day. You find yourself getting mad about silly stuff. We all do. Oh, yeah. And, and usually- you're mad at like road rage. Ah, that shouldn't even exist. I saw, but it does. Speaking of road rage, I saw two guys that looked like they were trying to kill themselves about a week ago. Oh, yeah? I had to slow way down. I'm like, look, if these two guys want to kill you're themselves. You're like swerving towards each oh, other. Oh, yeah. Stuff. You're like, yeah. what's going on? Yeah. I'm like, if y'all are so tough, pull over. And mix it up. Have a fight. Yeah. No, you're tough because you're in your little metal box. You yeah. can scream as loud as you want. Nobody <laughs> yeah. can do nothing. <laughs> Pull over, mix it up. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Accept the outcome and then leave and go on. Do you believe, speaking of that, do you believe these videos I've seen being posted all over Instagram of where like little girls can focus their chi and knock down their senseis or instructors? Because I kind of believe in that. I don't even know what videos you're watching. This goes back into what you watch in your <laughs> boxer shorts and your head, your, your headphones on. Moving on. Okay. We're going to talk about a YouTube comment that was posted. On ours? Uh, no, 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 no. This actually, Lon posted Uh-oh. this up on Phantom. No, but thought, there is a bunch. I thought you I thought you were about to start reading YouTube comments. I was like, <laughs> what? We didn't talk about this in the show meeting. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a horrible idea. <laughs> this isn't going to go well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. He's been suckered in. He's reading YouTube comments, folks. <laughs> Don't ever do that. Don't yeah. ever do that. Yeah. I made the mistake of doing it one time. Well, a couple times. When you feel good about yourself, you just have to go back and read YouTube comments. Oh, that was quite the opposite experience for me. This was years ago. It was late one night. I had a couple of cold beverages, and I started reading YouTube comments, and I started getting angry. Yeah. Mm-mm. And then I was like, I thought all kinds of things, cute, witty things I could write back retort in some way. Did you just close it and walk away? I just was like, no, I can't go down that path. I can't do it because it never will end. (laughs) Before we go on, did you type out a response and delete it multiple times? Yeah, I've done that enough times. Yeah. (laughs) Because you're mad and you're like, I don't think anybody, in in any type of social media, if you say you haven't done that, you're lying. (laughs) I I don't care. I can't engage in this. Or the people that are like, oh, it doesn't bother me, bro. You're lying. It bothers me. It does. It's okay. Yeah, if somebody says something real nasty about you on social media, it does bother you. Yeah. Even if you don't really care, later you'll be driving by yourself and be like, that son of a gun. Yeah. Can't believe he thought that. Yeah. Or, or they the misconstrue something and you're like, well, I need to I need to let them know that's that's not what I meant. Like the Stephen Hawking joke? Oh, yeah, right? <laughs> it's called sarcasm. Yeah. We got a lot of hate for that. Kyle did. Kyle, I did, personally. Yeah. Because it's I said, joke. I thought Stephen Hawking really wasn't that intelligent that he was just hooked to Google and a speaking spell. Yeah. You know. Look, is it is it right? Probably not, but no. is it funny? It's funny. It was just a joke. It's called sarcasm. It's a joke. I understand the guy's brilliant. I understand yeah. that. That's what makes it funny. It's, it is. It does make it funny. <laughs> but I do also know he's connected to computers. And if you gave me a quiz Here and I was go. connected to Google, I'd probably do pretty good on the quiz. <laughs> Here we go. Anyway. All right, moving on. This is an unexplained glitch a glitch while driving home. It says, my husband was in a rehabilitation center. For physical therapy following triple bypass heart surgery. And the rehab was two towns away from my house. 
And one night when I was leaving the rehab, I took the longer route home because it was more brightly lit. The shorter route was dark with no street lights, and I didn't like traveling that route after dark. So I was driving the longer brightly lit route when a car in front of me pulled to the side of the road and let me pass by. But strangely, as soon as I passed the car, it immediately pulled out and began following me closely with its high beams on. Just then, I crossed the border into the next town. Now, there are many stores and restaurants and a hotel in the area, so the lights are even brighter there. But suddenly, everything on the road went black, and I heard a sound like an overhead garage door closing says bang like that sound says yeah i found myself driving on a pitch black narrow road with no lights and no car following me i was not on the same road that i had been traveling i began talking out loud to myself saying what the hell where the hell am i what has happened it was then i realized that my headlights were shining on a street sign up ahead and it said gale road Gale Road was the dark, shortcut route that I absolutely did not take when I left the rehab center. I found myself almost all the way back to the rehab center, though I had already reached the next town when driving home. Now I had to repeat the drive. But this time, I had to take the other pitch black route home, the route that I did not want to drive in the first place. Says my husband always calls me when I got home. He knew the trip back home took me about 40 minutes. So I began thinking that this time he was going to wonder what was taking me so long to get home. I never looked at the time, but I assumed that whatever had happened, put me almost all the way, of course, back to the start, would have added at least an hour to my trip home, maybe longer. When I finally got home, the phone rang, and it was my husband. And before I told him what happened, I apologized for taking so long to get home, and I asked him how many times did he try to call me. This is first, there was silence on the other end, and then my husband said, This is my first time calling. It's only been about half an hour. You're not late. It was then that I explained to him what had happened to me. But in reality, I have no clue what actually happened. Was it a vortex in the road? Did the car that pulled over in front of me and then proceed to follow me have something to do with what happened? Has anyone else ever experienced anything like this? This is Sandra wrote this in hmm. on YouTube coming out. How crazy is that? It's a glitch in time. Right? Is it, or like we talk about in the Matrix, in this computer simulation that we're involved in, she glitched out. Right. Driving. Glitched out. Now, uh, you talk about freaking out. You imagine that you just drive along and then all of a sudden she's like, here's something, everything goes black. It's not like she closed her eyes, had missing time. Not, no, there was no missing time. It was like reset. Nope, start again. Like, how do you do that? What? There's no... There's no way. There's no physical explanation for exactly how that went down. Now, we're going to take a quick break, folks. And when we get back, uh, a listener named Jared uh, actually spurred this conversation off that I'm about to have with y'all when we come back for break about some crazy gold mine from Victoria Peak. The Victoria Peak treasure is next, folks. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. And we are back, and uh, we're going to dig in to, like I said, a listener of ours named Jared had heard me talking about, uh, you know, that we're going to be heading off to Colorado and running around and looking around up there, and then, you know, talking about New Mexico and us running around up there as we were youngsters and whatnot. And he had brought up uh, the Victoria Peak treasure. And this is something that I had remembered hearing about now it had been a while back and it's one of those ones like we talk about you you heard a little something or you read a little something and then it goes into the back of your mind you know and you don't think about it and then a few key words kick up this that and the other but the the fun thing is is this story is long there is a lot that goes into this uh and it's it's something that dreams are made of like uh uh indiana jones it's like indiana jones adventure dreams is what this is made of. So it, it takes place in, on, you know, inside Victoria Peak there in southern New Mexico is where it all kicks off. So I'm going to get into the long and the short of it. Pretty much the long at the or at the first, I guess you could say. And then there's going to be more. But basically, what ended up happening was this. And we have to go all the way back to November of 1937. And a fella named Doc 
Nos, all right? Uh, Doc was an interesting character, and I, I don't even know if we should... Dark Nos? Doc. Oh, Doc. Doc was his name, yeah. And like I said, I don't even know if we should get into who he was, you know? I mean, there's a lot that goes into... Uh, he was a very interesting character. His name was Milton, all right, was his name. Uh, he was an American businessman. Uh, he went by Doc, but uh, his name was Milton Ernest Noss. And it's the whole story is almost... It's almost too much. It's one of those stories that it's just almost unbelievable. I'm just going to get into it. There's no way we can dig around it. I'm just going to tell you the story as the way this rolls. It, like I said, 1937 November. He called his wife Babe. Now, I think her name was Ova. Now, he and Ova and some friends of theirs were deer hunting in a place called uh, Humbrello Basin there in New Mexico. And they would always camp. And they've been in this area before, but they would camp on the in the desert down there, on the little down below the mountains in there, and at the bottom of Victorio Peak. And at the time this went down that day in November, so all the guys get up and they head off, you know, hunting. They go on their separate ways and all that stuff. And the wives they stayed in camp. Now this is you're talking in the 30s. This is just the way things done. Everybody drives out the woods, puts up some canvas wall tents, and this is how they hang out and start going. So Doc's hunting by himself. So he's a running around the bottom of the mountain, you know, and he's checking all this stuff out. And I'm assuming they're probably hunting for mule deer as they're running around there in New Mexico. And he says it began to rain on them. So, you know, Doc's like, man, I need to get out of this rain. So I'm sure he doesn't have some really outstanding rain gear back in the 30s. So he finds this rocky little overhang uh, up near the top of the mountain where he's up on top. I'm sure he's glassing or doing whatever he can to look around. And he wants to get in out of the rain. So he you know, backs up under this little overhang and he's just sitting down. He's going to wait for the rain to let up. Well, while he's waiting down there, he said, he starts looking around and he sees this rock, a rather large stone. And in his words, he said, it looked like it had been worked. So by worked, I'm assuming what he means is like it had been chiseled on or it had been ground upon or, you know, pressure flaked on almost like flint, but it was not flint, of course. But so he had done all this, but it looked like man had worked this so he grabs this rock and he starts wiggling around trying to see if he can move it he's like you know because maybe you're onto something maybe you mm. find some cool artifact right yeah. so it's not moving so he you know he sets and he takes digs his boot heels in he's kicking around it so he takes his boots he starts kicking his heels around there and he starts digging the dirt out around this rock till he can kind of get his fingers around it he's like i'm digging this thing up so he starts pulling boop he gets it to move well it's bigger than he thinks what's shown you know it's just the top of it so he has to keep digging keep digging keep digging digs around gets it up gets the rock off well as he moves the rock there's a hole underneath it like a, a cave entrance but you know it's not like a huge one it's just you know about as big make a circle with your arms folks just like you're going to make a hoop like you're going to hug somebody it's a it's a rock about this side moved out of the way and there's this hole in the ground now he goes on to say he's looking in it goes straight down and from what he could tell into the mountain so he's looking down into this darkness you know and he's like hmm, what the heck's going on so he gets down a little bit where he can see and he says he can see that looks like there's a wooden pole. And on this wooden pole looks like it is tied to the side of this shaft that goes down into uh, the mountain. And the cool thing, too, is on that pole, he's like, you can see grooves cut into that pole, like for footholds. So it's like an old school style ladder. So instantly, being where they were at, Doc's like, oh man, I found an old mine shaft. You know, somebody just abandoned it, so they just put this rock over it, so nothing falls into it, right? Mm hmm. So he's like, all right, the rain stopped. He finished his hunt, and he goes back down to camp. And so he gets in there. He's going to have some coffee. His wife's got coffee made when he shows up. So he pulls her over to the side. He's like, sweetheart, come here for a second. And he tells her what he found. Well, she's like, hey, let's not tell everybody what we stumbled across. Let's let's have a little adventure. You know, let's not just everybody go running around up there. Wait for him to, you know, later on, and me and you'll come back. So, you know, she's like, that, that's a good idea. And he's like, yeah, that's, you know, they get together. So that's what they do. So a few days go by. So they come back, right? They're like, okay, we're going to come back and check this out. So they come back. Well, they bring a bunch of ropes and flashlights. And, you know, they they actually, when they went back to town, they got a bunch of gear with them and loaded up on a bunch of gear, decided to come back. So, you know, they've got all the stuff that they need to do spelunking. So Doc, at first when he gets there, you know, he's got some rope tied off. He gets on that wooden pole, right, where he's got his feet on. He's like, man, I'm not so sure this thing's going to hold me. Like this, I'm just, I don't feel so hot about this. I think I'm just going to, you know, drop some rope in there and I'll just slide down the rope and I can climb back out. You know, so I'm picturing that with the knots every few feet, you know, he throws it down in there. 
So he kind of, you know, old school repels, climbs down this rope into this this shaft. He had his flashlights, and I'm picturing like he's got one of those, the old, with the, the lantern on his helmet, you know, where he's got some light where he can see. So he's got his hard hat strapped on with his light on it and all this stuff. So his wife, you know, she waits up top. She's like, I'll just, I'll hang out up here. So he starts sliding down this this rope to get down in there, and he goes down. He he estimates around 60 feet. And what he's hoping is near the bottom, and there's a rock, like a boulder, stuck, almost blocking the entire shaft. But there's a hole over to one side of it, okay? Mm-hmm. So he's like, huh. Now, later on in 1946, he actually was talking to a, Doc himself was talking to a field representative of the New Mexico State Land Office, all right? And the guy's name was Mr. Herkinoff, Gordon Herkinoff. And Doc actually goes on in a report. It was a, a four-page report that was titled The Field Examination of NOS Mining. All right? Now, this is mining claims. And Herkinoff actually wrote this down. And when I read this to you, this is what Doc had said it was. He said, uh, Dr. NOS claims that beyond the 186-foot depth, 186 feet, there's an incline downward at 45 degrees for 72 feet. Beyond that, there's supposed to be another incline upwards at about 30 degrees for some distance, around 40 feet, where an entrance is gained to a cave some 2,700 feet long, which contains many evidences that the cave was occupied as living quarters by a large group of humans for many years. That's what was written. So, And this is in northeastern New Mexico? Mm-hmm. Now listen, we go on into this. So Doc finally gets down to the bottom, right? He works his way around that rock, okay? Mm-hmm. Gets yep. down to the bottom. And he said that it's a very small room. So he notices the minute he's down in there that there are not just drawings on the walls, but paintings. Something's painted all over these walls. And some of them were even like it chiseled in. Like you ever took a rock or another stick as a kid on that, just like old sandstone, and you can scratch your name in the yep. sandstone? Yep. That's what he's describing is it looks like it's chiseled designs in the walls along with the paintings and these charcoal drawings and all this and he said man it must have been made by the native americans in this area that's what this is this is going on so like i said he goes to the end of that chamber little you know it's not real big goes to the end of that chamber and there's another shaft that goes off of it so i'm picturing a hallway so he starts going down again so he goes down 125 feet he goes down this little descended corridor and then it levels off, and it levels off into what Doc said was just a giant natural void, like a cavern down there. And he said off of the walls of this cavern had been dug into and chiseled out smaller rooms. So you could tell it was used as like a gathering hall. So you've got the big open area, rooms off to the side. So he steps off in here, you know, now he's like, hmm. Now he claims, now this goes back, makes me start instantly, I start thinking about the uh, the Egyptians that were said to be in the Grand Canyon. Doc said he goes back and he said it kind of startles him because he sees a skeleton, right? Mm-hmm. And he goes, but the thing about it is this, this skeleton, what's left of it is slumped over a stake that's driven into the ground. So it's kind of piled up. You can see where this stake has been pounded into the ground and the bones, every, whatever's left of it, you can tell it's had its hands and every, it tied behind its back, its feet tied together. So whatever it was, this person had been left in here to die in the darkness by itself. Okay? Yeah, man. Now, it didn't take long. He said he starts shining the lights around. He f- starts finding more and more of these skeletons. And more that he finds are all staked out just like this. So the ones he's finding are tied off like this. So he goes a little bit further. He goes into these small rooms off to the side and he said there's skeletons stacked in these small rooms remains of people and what he ended up reporting on that he had seen was 27 he counted human skeletons in these little caves and all these little offshoots in this natural cavern area so he goes on to start looking down these side caverns now the ones that extend further in story goes that while he's in there he starts finding old saddles Okay. Mm -hmm. Coins, jewelry, some different artifacts. Claims that he found a statue of the Virgin Mary made out of solid gold. He goes on to say that he also found some old letters that were dated up into the 1880s. Now, mind you, this is 1937. So he's found them from the 1880s. Now, that was only the start. The cave goes deeper. So Doc keeps going. 
Well, he goes in there and he says, he's like, man, I, you know, there's some iron. There's just iron bars laying around down here stacked up. He said, there's about a thousand of them, several thousand of these bars. He said, now I can't hardly move them. They weigh about 40 pounds or better and they're stacked up against the wall. So he says, man, I could lift one, you know, but I don't know that I could carry it all the way back out. Now we go back into this folks later on. People have added this up, tried to add up what, what doc had found and all this stuff. They believe that the worth was a couple hundred, I'm sorry, a billion, around $2 billion worth of artifacts was in this cave. With, two, with a B? With two L's. <clears throat> billion. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Of like gold bars and stuff? Yeah, those aren't <clears throat> iron. That's gold. Okay? They don't right. know that shit. Now, he fills his pockets with these coins that he finds. He even goes on to say that he found a couple of swords down there that had jewels on them, so he can carry those real easy, right? Yeah. So he gets up there and he, you know, comes back out, shows his wife. He's like, look what I have found. Here's these gold coins. Look at these old swords. She's going crazy. So he tells her all that he saw. So she's like, you need to go back in there and get one of those iron bars. He's like, oh, okay. So he goes down in there and he messes around a little bit, goes back in, goes in this narrow passageway, and he finds one that he can carry real easy. It's about half as big as this other one. So he gets up there and he pulls it in. He's like, well, this is one of these little baby ones that I'm going to bring out. You know, he's like this, this little one here. So he's like, I'm not going back in there right now. This is it. So she takes this bar and she kind of scratches it around because it's grimy, right? Mm -hmm. Scratches it around in the sand, starts rubbing on it, rubs it across some rocks. That's whenever you can see that it's gold. You can see the actual gold shining through all this. So at this point, she realizes, oh, this is a solid gold bar that we've just pulled out of here. So after that moment, they started coming back all the time. That they would come, they put a tent, they started basically living at the bottom of this mountain, and they would go up there and they explored every tunnel inside this place. All right? Yeah, I'm with you. And on each trip, Doc would come out with two bars. He would just come out, he would carry all the artifacts that he could, but the two bars of solid gold was about all he could carry out. It even goes on to say that at one time he brought out a crown, that people, they claimed that there was over 243 diamonds in this thing, a blood ruby mounted in this thing. But Doc, <laughs> he so, wouldn't trust anybody, okay? What was you going to ask? So they have everything? I mean, they have rubies, diamonds, gold bars, swords. It, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds yeah, too yeah. good to be true. Yeah. <laughs> he would leave after he got all the stuff and brought it out and his wife saw it and all that stuff. At night, he would slip off and go bury it in the desert, only where he knew it. He wouldn't even trust his wife with it. <laughs> because, well, what is it? It's always the greed. The greed starts yeah. making people crazy. My precious. Yes. Now, he went on to report that he had actually found an artifact, or I'll say, a, I'm sorry, an artifact, a document. And he says that this document was dated all the way back to 1797, is what he claims. And that it was buried, now, and he says he's buried this, this document. In a, in a chest, a Wells Fargo chest, and that he had buried it out in the desert with a bunch of other stuff that he had hauled up out of there. But he says that this document, now, I guess there's copies of it that got out. Maybe he wrote it down. Maybe this goes with the story. I don't know how this all goes, because as far as I know, no one's ever found the original document. Nobody's ever found this chest. But the story goes that this document from 1797 was written by Pope Pius III, all right. And it uh -huh. was translated to say that seven, this is what that says that it says, seven is the holy number and that there's a passage and it says it continues on that there's a lot of lines in this, that this cryptic message to it, but that this document reads in seven languages, seven signs and languages in seven foreign nations, look for the seven cities of gold, seven miles north of El Paso del Norte in the seventh peak, Soldad. These cities have seven sealed doors, three sealed toward the rising of the soul sun, three sealed toward the setting of the soul sun, one deep within Casa del Cuevo de Oro at high noon. Receive health, wealth, and honor. Now, that's what he claims that was written by Pope Pius III. Mm -hmm. So you start going, well, where, like you said, where did all this stuff come from? Well, at this point is where the Native American chief Chief Victorio shows up, okay? Yeah. Now, you follow the history of any of the Native Americans is in this area. This, this whole legend around Chief Victorio is woven deeply in this area. Uh, 
he was uh, the chief of the Warm Springs Apache war tribes right through there. And that entire area on that whole base and the whole thing was where he pretty much lived and his whole tribe stayed at. Because at when all this went down, he refused. They were supposed to take the Apache in that area, move them to the San Carlos Reservation, okay, mm-hmm. in Arizona. He had already had family and other parts of his tribe that had been moved there. Well, they had been starved out. They had moved the natives there, and then I'm assuming the Calvary or whatnot had starved them out, and it just it wasn't a good spot that they had been moved to, right? Yeah. So he said, look, our people's lands are these mountains of New Mexico. I'm not leaving at all. So he said, I'm not, you know, you're going to have to come get me. You're going to have to come on there in this whole thing. But the federal government there in Washington, they promised that they could stay on the lands as long as what the, they said, the mountains stand and the rivers flowed. Now, get a load of this. It says that the discovery of gold in those mountains back in 1878 is what broke the treaty from the federal government. So the story goes that the federal government finally pulled back and said, hey, we'll tell you what, you don't have to go live where you want to live. Oh, there's there's gold there. Now get out. Now it's ours again. And Chief Victorio is like, no, now we're just going to (laughs) fight. So he went to war with them. Well, you got to imagine how it's not. Uh, a, a cavalry soldier, you know, uh, is not going to be doing so well battling a native in his home turf. So right. it's not going to work out so good for him. Also, too, he didn't care, right? He didn't care about gold. They said that, you know, they didn't care about gold. It was useless to them, but he knew that the white man cared for it. So the story goes that all through the Rio Grande Valley that him and his war tribe would attack immigrants, mail coaches, churches, wagon trains, pretty much anything that he knew he could get gold and money from, right? Yeah. He would even raid the stage lines all over New Mexico, even into Texas. And then, like I said, he was at war with the U.S. Army and the Texas Rangers at this whole time this is going on. It is also said that he would take prisoners and take them back to this this basin, this basin that he you know was hired out in, and they said that he would put them in a, a test of bravery. So it would be like a he would torture them, but it was a bravery test. And then, of course, he would kill them, which is what Doc even alluded to was the reason that they were score they were skeletons staked out in the bottom um, yeah. of this this cavern. So people were like, "Huh? Well, that might explain some of the the saddles or the Wells Fargo bags or some of the stuff that was found that Doc claimed that he had found there." Now, like I said, some of them believe, and some of the people that have researched it, and these treasure hunters believe that the Casa de Cuervo de Oro was what he had found, right? Mm-hmm. There's, a, 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 there's another one that goes into this. When I say another one, there was another name that comes up, and this other name is the treasure of Don Juan de Onet. Back in 1958, he founded New Mexico as a Spanish colony. So they said that he was seeking out the seven cities of gold, and it is said that, that he was a very, like we've always heard that these... A lot of these uh, explorers were very cruel to the natives in this area. And they said that uh, any of the natives in this area, that if he would use them for whatever work he needed and then that he would torture them. If they didn't do as he said, he would beat them or kill them and do all kinds of this horrible things to the natives in this area. Story goes that he, going through these lands, uh, pretty much just took whatever he wanted anytime he could find it. If he could find silver, if he found any jewels, any gold, anything, that he had a massive amount of this stuff and that finally word was sent to him in 1607 that he had to come back to Mexico city. Right. Mm -hmm. And they believe, I guess that maybe he had hidden it in this area. Some also think that it was, uh, Mexico's emperor in the 18, uh, the the fellow that served, uh, the emperor there. It was apparently the emperor Maximilian and, uh, in the 1860s, and they said that Maximilian had heard that there was going to be a plot to assassinate him there in Mexico. And the story says that, oh, well, maybe he packed up all this and had it sent out to Mex- to New Mexico to send it up into North America to get rid of all, hide all his goals. Like he was going to be able to make a run for it, things like that. We don't know. There's a bunch of these, you know, stuff. In, in, in fact, Maximilian ended up becoming assassinated in 1867. But. There's a lot of really wild stories about, well, where did this money come from? Was it this explorer? Was it this? You know, 
This isn't just something somewhere in history. They would be a lineage to where this much money came from. The natives in this area, the Apache didn't just steal that much and hide it down there. It's just you're just not going to be able to do that. There wasn't that much coming and going and passing on the rail lines like that. So well, that's what where I was going to say is from? like, where the heck did all that treasure come yeah. from? Well, that's what they're getting into. Some even go on to believe that there was a Catholic missionary named Felipe Larue or Larue's. Uh, they believe that he because there was church documents that have his name, that he was native to France, and that he was actually a small in a small group of priests who volunteered to be sent into service in Mexico. So the story goes with him that they had sailed into Florida, that they come through the Gulf of Mexico to Veracruz and all this, and then they went you know, to Mexico City and they took all this stuff up. And they called him Padre, right? Philippe there, Padre LaRue. And that he went north, and then as he was working his way up north, that uh, he took a lot of the natives with him and all this stuff. And he actually had a large place that he worked at and uh, there in Chihuahua there in 1798. And they said that there were some people from this area and all this stuff had heard stories about this rich source of minerals in the mountains to the north. So if he was interested in all that stuff, there's no writing about it. So nobody could really tell if it, the spur of gold and gold fever drove him in that direction. But the story says that uh, he continued teaching and ministering and all that stuff to this small group of people, and that among this group of people, that there was an old man who said that he had been an explorer and basically a soldier of fortune, a mercenary, if you will, that had lived his life in this whole area in North America. Now, he was in South America now, of course, and in Mexico and all, but he had lived up in this whole area, and that uh, LaRue actually took care of him, all right? Mm -hmm. So you got to imagine an old man laying there dying. And they become real good friends. LaRue, you know, just instantly bonded with him in his storytelling, and it's great. So the story goes with LaRue that one day he's like, hey, I keep hearing these stories about all of this wealth that's up in these mountains. Like, what do you, if you've been all over, right. what can you tell me about it? And the old man looked and he said, Padre, if you want gold, it's located high in the mountains, about two days north of El Paso del Norte, which, of course, is El Paso, Texas. He said, if you go there, he said, you get to El Paso. He said, it's one day after one day's travel from El Paso heading north. He said, you're going to see three small peaks further north. He said, when you first see these peaks, when you first lay eyes on them, he said, I want you to turn east and you're going to go across this little desert back in towards the mountains. He said, in these mountains, you're going to see a basin. And in this basin, he said, at the foot, there's a solitary peak that stands out there all alone. He said, if you go up on top of that peak, the top tip top of that mountain, he said, you're going to find gold. It's up there. So he had known these stories and these tales up until this point. So the Padre, of course, sits on this knowledge for a while. And yeah, not, why wouldn't he go himself? The old man? Yeah. He couldn't. I mean, he was, we're talking old, 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 old yeah. uh, laying there he dying. He when he was yeah. younger, man. So he tells this story. Well, finally, the old man passes away. And after he passes away, you know, LaRue is constantly thinking about this. Of course, like anybody would. You know, whatever he's willing about it would. So it goes on a little bit longer, a little bit longer. Well, the crops there, okay, in the, in the town he's working in, the crops start failing, things like that. It's, people are just, they're just not doing good in this area down there so he's like what am i going to do with my whole you know my, my parishioners what am i supposed to do with this group of people he knows that they need water he knows that they need food he knows that they need so he finally is like hey i need the giant gold virgin mary statue yeah. that's up there well he pretty much asked him he goes what if we go to a new place would y'all follow me if we go to a new place so in the back of his mind he's like if they say yeah we're going right we're heading north is what we're going to do so sure enough he goes north and they're like yeah we'll go with you they head up that whole deal so they actually get into a village not far from Las Cruces, okay? Yeah. And as they're going up to Las Cruces, he sees the peaks, and he turns east, and he goes through the little desert, and he actually gets to the San Andreas Mountains. And then while he's there, he's looking around doing a little exploration, and he sees the basin, and he finds the natural spring at the base of this single solo mountain sticking up there. Now, the treasure hunters that follow this story and keep up with all this believe that the basin is Hembrillio Basin and that the peak is Soldad Peak, okay? Yeah. Now, like we said, you go through this whole thing. We've talked about Chief Victorio and the army and the battle up there. 
this whole thing. So LaRue puts out just a basic camp with all of his people. And while he's there, he sends some guys out to start looking around. He's like, just get up there and look around, see what you can find. Well, one of them comes back and he's like, hey, on one side over here, we actually found a vein of what we think is gold. So what do they find? Gold. They go up there. They start digging it. They actually work the mine. He gets his people up there. They work the mine. They dig. They dig. They go. They get. It's crazy. The deeper they go, they said the ore is just everywhere. Hmm. So they get. He gets and and basically sends word. They send up more monks. A lot of the natives come up there. They start working. This whole story goes that apparently he's found all this stuff, right? The whole thing, and that he got people from the local areas. I guess other. I'm assuming since it, it was the Spanish that it was Catholic, so he gets the other Catholic monks, the natives in this area, whatever he can do. He gets all the help. He may have even had some with him, but he gets all of them to start helping him and whatever supplies, and they start from what you can read, melting the gold down and turning it into ingot. ingots is what they say. And that they find the natural cave. So while they're staying around this area, they're stacking gold in this thing. Well, the rest of the story says that uh, the church back in Mexico City gets word of this. I don't know if one of the monks finally gets fed up, you know, and goes back. It's like, I'm telling on them, right? Goes back. Well, they start going through. They go to the, the little hacienda there in Chihuahua. Well, guess what? He's not there. The whole colony that LaRue, the Padre, was over is missing. Well, of course they are. They're working in the gold mine, right? Right, yeah. That's where they're at. So the story goes that they send some people up there to start to try to find them. Like, what's going on? Where did our Padre go? So they go up there. One of the monks come back. He's like, hey, that's uh, true. The whole population of this town that, that the Padre LaRue was over is in the mountains working. It's documented in the church. Yep, that's what we found. This is what's going on. So they uh, they send the you know some more people up there like look we've got to figure out what we we got to get them out of there basically so another small group goes up there this whole thing well it's not really a small group it's a Mexican army well, he sends a group of his guys in the town to get some more I say in the town into some area to get some more supplies and while they're in town they hear the whispers of oh yeah they've been coming and going through this town and staying here they're coming to find y'all they've come to look for you there's been spies in this area they know y'all are up there. Boom. So what happens? They run back up. They tell Padre LaRue that he's in serious trouble because he left the city. He left the town that he was supposed to be looking after everything for this whole, the whole deal, right? Mm -hmm. So they said, not only that, we want you to bring all that gold back because we're going to send it to Spain. Yeah. No, <laughs> no. He starts hiding everything. They, the story goes that not only he, but everybody under basically his view or you, you could call it protection, I suppose. He worked them night and day to not only get all the gold finished and put up, but to hide everything. They hid every entrance. They hid everything that you could find out. Story goes, the soldiers finally get up there. They want to know where the gold is, and they want to know, you know, which was used. How would you buy all this stuff, the whole thing? Padre will not answer. Well, of course, following along the way it used to go that way, what do they do? They just decide, well, I'll tell you what, we'll just torture you. That's the way it's going to be. You know, you've, you've strayed from God. <laughs> Guess what you get to go through? The Inquisition. So they run him through all that. He dies. He died, and almost all of his followers that were with him, the story says, died from torture because none of them would tell. Because they knew, now that's the story they go, none of them spoke, yeah, right. that they knew that they didn't want to lose what they had. So the soldiers, they look everywhere. They finally return back to Mexico City with the, what they had had. They brought, I guess they brought the body of the Padre back, the whole thing. They come back with this whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. Story goes, they show back up to the church. They're like, man, we don't have a thing for you. We can't, we tortured them. They're dead. We went everywhere. We've turned over every stone. Still don't know where it is. We don't have any idea. That's what the soldiers are like. We don't know if the stories were true. I mean, we have to assume that everything we heard was true, but they never, they never shared anything with us. So from that point forward, you start digging around in the history books. It was called the Lost Padre Mine. Yeah. All right? Yeah, makes sense. So like I said, so now you jump from 1937. Now we're bounced back with Doc to 1939. So two years after he had found all this stuff, he decides, I need to make a bigger hole than that little hole I'm shinnying down in, okay? So he goes and gets a buddy. He's an engineer named S.E. Montgomery. And he's going to go up there with Montgomery up into there, and they're going to blast a hole. Oh, no. Yeah, they're going to blow the shaft out so they can get in there. So Montgomery goes to look and does some measurements and all this stuff. He's like, you know what? 
eight sticks of dynamite. Eight sticks of dynamite will do exactly what we need to do. Well, Doc, no one better, of course, like, nah, 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 nah. It's too unstable. You can't use eight sticks of dynamite, man. I'm telling you, I've been down in there. Don't do it. It's too big of an explosion. Well, the engineer's like, no, you don't know what you're talking about. Eight sticks will be perfect. So they set the blast up, blowing eight sticks of dynamite up, collapsing the entire shaft. Uh, One stick of dynamite probably would have done it. Story goes, it collapsed, caved in everything, the whole deal. Doc at this time shut out of his own mind, basically. He's like, I can't get back in there, right? He tried. They said over and over he tried. They said there were tons and tons of rock and dirt filled this all this stuff up. They said at this point, Doc is furious. He's losing his mind because it was right in front of him. Now it's gone, okay? They say that it changed him completely. He His marriage fell apart. He soon left his wife. In 1945, they were actually, you know, by law, divorced. But he had already abandoned her. He just got rid of everything. After that, two years after that, in fact, he marries another woman named Violet. Now, it got even worse because Doc had actually turned, I guess, this into a mine. He had actually filed paperwork and all this, right? Yeah. The story goes on to say that instead of having all of these thousands and thousands of gold and all the stuff that he had that doc only had like a few hundred that he had hidden because i guess he didn't get them all out right so he goes well what am i gonna do so doc gets with another fella he's like you know that transported this all this stuff with him and said he's gonna start selling them on the black market story goes on that for about nine years doc tried to sell all this gold but he couldn't find anybody to buy it right nobody's gonna buy it so in 1948 doc meets a fella named charles ryan charles ryan just happens to be a texan Charles Ryan is doing a bunch of exploring out in West Texas, looking to do some drilling for oil. Well, Doc finds out about him. He goes to meet Ryan. They start chit-chatting. He goes, hey, you've got the ability to do all this big digging, right? He's like, yeah, of course. He goes, well, I'll tell you what. I'll give you some gold bars for what it would cost. Do you think you could reopen that shaft? He's like, yeah, for $25,000. In 1948, $25,000. That's a lot of, yeah, it's a lot of cheddar. Yeah. He goes, uh, I'll do it. I'll do it if, if, if you can get me all that stuff. He's like, okay, we're, gonna, we're going for it. Well, uh, Ova, oh, the one he called Babe, his first wife, correct? Mm-hmm. She had already gone in there and it filed a counterclaim with the law office to deny entry, all right, by anything to try to find who was, the, I guess the, she wanted them to determine who was the legal owner of the mine. So when Ryan, of course, old Charles Ryan, he's going through all this. He hears about all this stuff that's going on, right? He's like, huh, what's happening? Well, at this point, Doc starts, you know, he's already frazzled, right? He's already unraveling if he was sane to start with. They said he feels like Ryan is fixing to double cross him. Charles Ryan is going to wait and see if the wife gets, whoever gets owner ownership. So we have to assume that Ryan, that Charles Ryan was already kind of on the up and up knowing what was going on here. Mm -hmm. So we have to also assume that, oh, okay. All right, what we're going to do is this. So he thought he was going to uh, double cross him. He was going to wait to see who owned the mine, whichever one got it, either Doc or his wife, legally. And then he was going to go to them and go, I'll go ahead and open it up for X amount of this or however it's going to be. So Doc, freaking out, decides, you know what I think I'll do? I'm going to go dig up that gold that I was going to, you know, give old Ryan. I'm going to move it. I'm going to move it somewhere where Charles doesn't know where it's at. So story, I guess, so is that he had actually shown Charles the gold and that Charles knew where some of this gold was. So he was afraid that Charles was going to go dig up the gold. Exactly. Flip on him, basically. That's the problem when you take on any partners when it comes to yeah. these deals is you got to always worry yeah. that they're not going to just whack you out and then take and, all that stuff. And take it and right. go. Yeah. So this is in March. So this is March 5th of 49. So that night on the 4th, Doc had moved the gold because he just didn't have a good feeling, right? Mm -hmm. So Charles Ryan shows back up. He's like, what happened to the gold you were going to pay me? Where's this at? So they show up. They meet at the area where the gold was, but Doc moved it on him, Uh, right? So he's like, wait a minute. Where is it at? What's going on? So he's like, well, before we do any of this stuff, because I, I guess the way the whole story boils down is this. Either Ryan had the ability to dig it himself, you know, get the yeah. crew to come do it, or Ryan was going to take the gold and pay Doc cash, $25,000 cash, 
for the gold. So Ryan could, I'm sorry, so Doc could in turn take that cash, basically laundering it because of the gold act. Remember the gold acts, all this stuff. You can't just go around selling gold, you know, no, back in right. the day. So I'm, I'm guessing that there's two angles to this. Like I said, either Charles Ryan had the ability to, to have it dug. That's kind of one angle that it talks about, or he had the cash because of what business he was in and he was going to pay Doc for the gold. You give me two bars of gold, I'll give you $25,000. Then you can go hire it done from this point forward. Correct? Yes. So uh, Ryan shows up with the cash. Where's my gold? I'm going to buy that gold. I want it. You know, I'm, where's this all thing at? Nah, and Nas is like, well, before I tell you where it's at, show me the cash. Where's all this stuff up? You know, I, I want to see all this. So Ryan at this point is fed up. He's like, look, dude, you either tell me where the gold is or you're not going to be alive long enough to, to enjoy this money. Okay? Yeah. Story goes that after that, they, of course, they get into it. You can't talk to me like that, you know, and all this stuff. So it's twenty five grand in 1949 is a lot of money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're going back and forth. So Noss is like, all right, all right. So he goes to walking towards his car. Well, Charles Ryan says he was afraid that Doc was uh, going to get a gun. So uh, Charles pulls his pistol out and shoots over there by Doc. He's like, okay, get on out of there. You know, no, 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 no. You're not going to go over there and get a gun and take my money away from me. So he tells him to leave, to get away from the car. Doc says, nah, nah, baby, I ain't doing it again. So Charles Ryan fires another shot, shoots Doc right in the face, hits him in the head, killing Doc Noss dead before he hit the ground. Wow. Yeah. 12 years after finding this whole thing, Doc Noss is laying there dead beside his car with $2.16 in his pocket. Now, they go to court. But no one. But Doc was the only one that knows where the gold was. He's the only one. And Ryan said he was afraid because he gets acquitted. He's charged with murder and later gets acquitted. Story goes because he was afraid that Doc was going to get a gun, turn around and kill him to take the money. Right, right. Because in Ryan's mind, there was no gold. Now, he may have showed it to him, but, I mean, we all know you could probably fake it if he wanted to. You know, who knows how this whole thing worked right, out. Right, right. It's two guys, but the only story, the only side of the story we're getting is the guy that was alive. And you ain't getting both sides of the story, right? That's true. But we do know something was going on because his ex-wife had filed that uh, onto her. The good thing is this, though. They had made a claim. Her, his ex-wife, the one over our babe or whatnot, had made a claim with Doc when they first found all that at Victoria Peak, okay? Yeah. So she still had it. Remember, she had filed because she was fighting with him for who was the rightful owner. Well, she still had all that, all the paperwork, all the filings. So with Doc dead, it's hers. It's all 100% hers. Wow. So she's like, okay, I'm going to have some people clear this shaft. So she would randomly at times hire men to go out and move rock. Probably because it would cost a fortune to get in there and dig around. And you don't want a lot of people digging around in there because you don't want them to come back. How are you going to guard it if you're you know, an older yeah. woman? How are you going to guard that's this That's what I was thing? saying earlier. Is you you got to be careful sharing the information. You don't want to crew 200 people there because that's 200 people yeah. that now know that there's a huge treasure there. Uh, exactly. It gets even wackier than that, though. The government gets involved in this whole thing. When the I government. Say, in 1955, the White Sands Missile Range decides to expand, okay? Oh, yeah. They and did. as they expand, they take in Humbrillio Basin. So and it's like eminent domain. Oh, yeah. There's nothing you can. They don't care. They don't ask you if you want to sell. They tell you you're selling it now. Here's the worst part of that. So they take in that whole area. All right. She has the claim on this whole area, on this land, this whole deal. She starts filing requests. She's like, dude, that's my land. I've got to get in there. I've got to work and get all this stuff out. They just ignore it. They're like, no, nah, I don't think so. She would go in there to start clearing it out and send people in there. The military would escort them armed off the property. No, I don't think so. From 1955, that's when it all started in, in courts, in the legal system, of ownership on who owns this land. The military claim said, you know, and, and there was even a, a statement made by the New Mexico officials in that area in 1951. They're talking about that, that they had reserved this land for military use only. Okay? And because of that, that it had withdrawn any prospecting ability. You couldn't have entry. You couldn't have any location. You couldn't even purchase under any of the mining laws. It did not matter. It didn't. They didn't care. Okay? Yeah. Now, New Mexico officials said that they had leased only the surface of the land to the military. So there was two sides of this whole thing. Military owns all that. And 
And old babe, Doc's, uh, Doc's ex-wife, was like, no, 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 no. You may have the top. I got what's inside that mountain. That's what's inside's mine. Right. So it goes to this whole thing. Well, they couldn't, like I said, it, still, it would get more and more complicated. They would search all of these. This is the worst part. They searched all the mining records, okay, in air quotes. So they couldn't turn up anything that had that of Doc Noss's name on it. Oh, yeah, because it's the U.S. government. They don't have to turn over. Oh, yeah. Oh, we don't see that and just throw it in the trash. You know what I mean? Right. So they're like, no, no. The Actually, too, where the land of Victorio Peak is located is not owned by the state of New Mexico, but by a fellow named Roy Henderson. And Roy Henderson, that wasn't New Mexican land. That was private land, and he leased all of it to the U.S. Army. So Doc didn't even do his homework to find all that out if this story is all true. So... They finally worked it all out in federal court. There was a compromise, and it stated this, that the Army would continue to use the surface of the land, but no one would be allowed on the property without the Army's consent. So, no one could ever mine the treasure, and the story goes that that meant nobody in the the Army couldn't get to it, and neither could she. That was the story. Now, the military refused any of her efforts at all to come in there and work, okay? Well, they got top secret stuff yeah. going on. They don't care about you chasing some no. lost gold. But here's the greatest thing. Said the Army couldn't work it, not other military personnel. They could come in there and do exploration of Victoria Peak. There were two airmen from Hallman Air Force Base would go on record and later say that they had found the gold cavern from another natural opening on the other side of the mountain, the other side of the peak. The military did. Yeah, there was a fella that was an airman first class named Thomas Burlett and a Captain Leonard Fague, and they said that they had found approximately 100 gold bars weighing between 40 and 80 pounds each in a small cavern, and that after the discovery, Captain Fague went on to tell people that uh, he had caved in the roof and the walls to make it look as if the tunnel had ended. Now, neither of these men had any idea about the laws to talk about the discovery of this whole thing. Right. So Fague goes in to the, the advocate, this judge advocate's office there at the Air Force Base, and he's talking to a fellow named Colonel Gaswitz. Okay? Yeah. Now there's two involved, okay? The airmen and the army are now involved. So Burlett and Fig, they what do they do? All right, well, let's go form a corporation. Let's go form a corporation real quick. We're going to just basically cover our butts on what we found, okay? And they made a formal application to enter White Sands to search and retrieval of this gold. But White Sands forbid it. They canceled it. So the airmen like, no, 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 no. We've already gone through all this, boys, and we just shut it down. You can't be over this because you were up there running around doing your thing and found it. It's not yours to find. Let me guess, though. They kept it. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So in the summers of 1961, in that summer, there was a fellow, the director of the Mint, Major General John Schinkel, there at White Sands. He, this would give him the advice, he allowed Captain Feig, a Captain Swanner and Major Kelly and a Colonel Gorman, those men, to work the claim. He's like, yep, we'll we'll let you work this. So on August 5th, you know, like we said, Mr. Feig there, him and his buddies go back, and that they are actually accompanied at this time by a command, the commander of the missile range, 14 MPs, and a Secret Service agent, is the way the story is told. And they said that Captain Feig was unable to get that opening that he had caused the collapse in three years ago so it's three years have gone by since he's been allowed on there he can't get back in he can't penetrate back into that mountain they can't uncover it so general Schinkel, the man that allowed them to go on there said all right that's it get out of here you're done i give you a chance you couldn't prove me anything other than just i guess what most of them thought was that they really wasn't anything in there they were just going to look for it they hadn't well, found they can't anything. have people snooping around their secret base Even under if you're the military. pretense of saying we're looking for gold. So they're like, exactly. the only way to get these bozos to go away is to let them look. Let them so look. I'll give you a couple weeks to look. If you don't find nothing, you're out of here. Yeah. Sorry, we, we gave you a shot. Yeah. Makes Later sense. on, Commander F- or, oh, Feig, Captain Feig, even took a lie detector test so that it would allow him back on the base, okay? Yeah. So they were like, is this really what you're looking for? They want to put this hole through there. Story goes, at this time... In this exact spot where he had found all this and the commander had seen it and said, we're done with it and all this stuff, that there was a full-scale mining operation going on there on the side of that mountain. The military were doing. Now, 
the uh, old that, the that old makes gal. Sense, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So the wife, oh babe, she babe. had heard. Yeah, she had heard that the military is working the claim that she said that she had had, which we know now didn't exist. Yeah, it was some other guy's land. It was another guy's land. They never they never found anything with the claim. This whole deal. So she hires some guys to uh, sneaky sneaky onto the military base. Right? Yeah, that's not smart. No, they get caught. They get caught trespassing, of course, while they get up there on the mountain. They get escorted off at gunpoint, carried away. They come back to her. They're like, uh, not only are there armed men in fatigues, like in military camo, armed on this mountain, multiple, but there are men working on the, there is a mining group going on on the side of this mountain. There was even an affidavit. Signed October 28th of 1961, claiming uh, that they had seen a military jeep and a weapons carrier on the mountain. Okay? I'm with you. They even said that she, talking about Babe, uh, started reporting on this whole thing that she reached out to a fellow named Oscar Jordan with the New Mexico State Land Office. And he starts going back through the Judd Advocate's office there at White Sands. Right? Yeah. So he's like, what what is going on? You know, you said that nobody could be on there and that we've settled all this. You're not going to let her on it. Now the military is mining it. You know, they've already said all this. So like we said, so General Schinkel has to look into this. Well, uh, apparently General Schinkel didn't even know that they were mining it. Air quotes. Didn't know. Right. Yeah. So he stopped everybody. Well, in 1963, there's another mining company called Gaddis Mining Company out of Denver. And they had a contract with the Denver Mint and the Museum of New Mexico, and they obtained permission to go in there to the site. And for three months in 1963, so starting at June 20th, they went all through there, and they used all of these mining techniques to find all this stuff, and even aerial photos looking at this whole thing. Story goes that they didn't find anything at this whole place. They didn't find Nothing. They're like, oh, well, well, of course we you would, anything. Of course you would say that, though, yeah. even if you did find something. Because once you admit that you found something, then you're going to have people filing lawsuits trying to get their property back. And if you're like, no, we looked. We looked really good. I didn't see nothing I didn't there. see nothing. Uh, in 1960, or 1972, F. Lee Bailey gets involved in this whole thing. He gets drawn in. He's representing, like, over 50 clients. Babe Noss, you know, Doc's ex-wife being one of them, all of these treasure hunters, a whole, I mean, the Feigs, him and his buddies, you know, they've built their their little business. He's representing them. So what they do is they compromise. They're with the military. All right. So they're like, well, what? we're going to have to let these people in. You guys can't hoard this all to yourself. When this, this started 20 years before y'all took it over, this has been going on. So they led a group, okay, called Expeditions Unlimited. Now, that's a Florida treasure hunting group. They rep- they let Ep- Expeditions Unlimited represent all of them. And they said, okay, we're going to compromise. They're going to let Expeditions Unlimited come in here, and we're going to let them excavate the peak where all this is allegedly taking place. So in 1977, they're going to come in. The Army steps in and goes, well, we'll let you come in, but you get two weeks. That's it. That's all you get. Well, in two weeks, they couldn't hardly get the ball rolling, you know, because you got a lot of work to try to make up in two weeks. So two weeks goes by. They didn't find anything in two weeks. The Army, gunpoint, get out of here. Go on. At that point, the Army shuts down all operations, and they said that there are no additional searches allowed ever on this whole thing. You're never, that's it. It's over. You're not going to be allowed to, to look in here again. Doc's wife, babe, dies in 1979, never knowing what happened. Nothing. At all. Well, her grandson, Terry Delonis, goes on and forms the Ovanos Family Partnership. Okay? So, doing to that, he starts telling these stories. He's trying to get the world, like what I'm sharing with y'all, to know about this, to get people going on. Well, uh, you know, like we said, you go on, you go on. The, the, all these stories start popping up. So, they start going, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to to know if it's a, a real thing? So this, there was a story, but the man, like I said, Captain Swanner, he was stationed at White Sands, okay, in, in the 1960s, and he comes forward. 
and he starts telling the surviving Nas family and all this stuff what he had seen. And he was actually at the time in 1961, the chief of security. And he said that he was sent to inspect the report made by Burlett and Captain Feig back when it all went down. So he comes forward after all this time. He's like, I had to go check it all out. He said, I determined at the time that the report was accurate. So the entire place at this time was made off limits to the military. You know, he's like, wait, what those guys just told us is true. Lock it down. We're going to go check on it. They go this whole thing. Well, reportedly or allegedly, let's say in air quotes, that the military actually gained entrance, gained access to one of those caves and found everything that was in there. And the story goes from this fella that the gold was taken and sent to Fort Knox. Now, the military did confirm that Swanner had served at White Sands during this time. But they go on to say, oh, no, there was never any documents or anything about that claim. He never went and investigated any of that stuff about the removal of gold bars or all that. Like, no, no, that's just a joke. So as far as we know now, the military doesn't, they don't even acknowledge the whereabouts of the gold. Nobody even know, you know, this they don't acknowledge thing. that they even found anything. No, 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 no. M- most of the entire Nos family that that was involved in this, Docs and, and you know, his ex-wives and all this stuff, they all believe that the military got involved when they expanded. Like, like they just stumbled upon it. Some believe that the military knew and found out about this over these years, and then they expanded it to stop it so they could have it. Right. Others, you know, who really knows? Now, like I told you about her grandson, Terry. Her grandson, Terry, has actually been quoted saying this, that we are not accusing the military of stealing the gold, but I do feel that the Department of the Army in the 1960s treated my grandmother unfairly. However, we've worked very hard over the years to establish a working relationship with the military, and we're certainly not going to jeopardize that by accusing them of theft. So, he won't come right out and say you did it. A lot of the other family will. So they've come out and it's like, we know you did it, this whole thing. They don't. There's never been that. Look, there's there's photo, you know. I say photographs. There's photographs of aerial shots of this area. Some people point to certain things, say this is it. That is it. We don't really know. It's like I've not seen anybody come forward and had stuff set and said, look, these are the old saddles. This is the gold bars. These are the old Wells Fargo. This is the old paperwork. You know, you always hear the whispers, like, we've seen this, or I've seen yeah, that. I was going to say, did Mr. Noss, did he ever produce these swords or anything, or has he just claimed that it's, he took a couple gold bars? Well, no. The, the, the workaround on that whole thing is this. They said that if it wasn't real, then why, after he's dead, did his ex-wife continue the battle to get in there? She didn't know where he moved it. Remember, she he abandoned right, her he and went it. and hit he it. He showed it to her, but and then she when she went to sleep, he hit it. She helped him pack it out. She spent two years of her life. So she life saw it. She in, physically saw it. She physically saw every bit of it. They're like, it would be one thing if it was an old man that was just claiming all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. But his ex-wife said, "I have, why would you continue the fight? So people now believe that even as crazy and outlandish as this story is, that they're like, no, there's a lot of truth to this story, that something was found in that cave that was gold. We don't know where it come from. We don't know this cache of there's no telling how it got there rubies it may have and been, diamonds and swords and it may have been a little bit of all those stories the stories i told you about the padre the stories i told you about the explorers the stories we discussed yeah. about the native americans it may have been one may have stumbled upon the other and then the other one stumbled upon that and was like now this cave is mine it may have worked its way up to the where the native americans were like this cave is this is where we're going to keep everything and then as as time went on it's kind of in the passing has gone by there's a lot more to this story of of the twists and turns and how people were stabbing each other in the back and trying to, to try to get this all on their own. But it's crazy. The story that the idea that this could actually be in the New Mexican desert, of course it's not there anymore. But that this may not be the only one. That this, the tales of of lost treasure, as grandiose and as crazy as it sounds, may truly be for real. That all, all these stories that we hear may have a lot of truth to them. Mm, pretty wild, right? It is. I'm glad y'all uh, hopefully enjoyed it. I enjoyed talking about it. It's one of my favorite old school stories. Let's take a quick break. And we'll come back. We'll wrap this dumpling up. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. And we're back with Expanded Perspectives. 
Man, that is, I like the stories of treasure. When you're talking about it the whole time, I'm thinking of like, what's the movie with Nicolas Cage? The National Treasure. National Treasure. And they there find the room there, you know, and I'm thinking about just the, all the different types of gold and jewels and things like that that are in that room. I looked it up during the break. Um, I went to savings.org. Yeah. And they have an inflation calculator over there. Oh, and $25,000 in 1949 is worth $250,448.13 today. That'd been a pretty penny right there. So, right. You're looking at a quarter of a million yeah. dollars. Yeah. A, so, no wonder people were willing to pull firearms yeah, or whatever. I mean, things were really to get crazy. And like I said, I may have to talk about more of this. I, I've got more I could probably share on the Elite Show or whatnot that gets into, into depth about what uh, Miss Noss, what Ova saw. Gets into depth of what Captain Feig reported on seeing in there. There's a lot of stuff where you can really, like I said, even the guys that were hired. I mean, there's a lot of this stuff where it gets into more and more detail to where it leads you to believe that everybody that was involved that claimed that they were in there really did see what they were claiming they saw. Well, they definitely had a little bit more than just tall tales because they spent yeah. a, it was with whatever, who it was, how many groups of people. And the military. Untold amounts of money. Yeah. 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 Yeah, there was a lot more invested in that than than what just a story being told. Yeah, man, that is interesting. I love the stories of uh, the lost treasure like that. And speaking of lost treasures, did you ever watch the new movie, the the Lost Z or whatever? The uh, I have not watched that. Oh, yet. What is it called? Lost City of Z. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen it either. I recently saw it was on. Uh, it was on Stars. I saw it on there. So I'm like, man, I think I'm going to give that a watch. I need to watch that after yeah, I get right. done with Black Sales. I don't like having too many things going at one time. I like to finish one thing before I start the next one. I'm not a very good multitasker. <laughs> um, Can't quite multitask, huh? Yeah, no. So um, what do you got planned for the rest of your week? Uh, well, like I said, my wife goes back out of town, so I'll be Mr. Mom and it all over again. Right. Uh, I have been pumping out videos on YouTube. I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. For whatever reason, we have a large following over on YouTube, and when you don't have time to post videos, they won't come and follow you anywhere else. I don't no. understand that. No. But uh, I, I noticed over the weekend that you've been all been posting new YouTube videos. I've been posting those out. I've been doing some more editing and stuff like we talked about to do some more filming and things that we're doing. In fact, we've been looking at a couple of other cameras we'd like to get to do a little uh, 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 more videoing and whatnot. But yeah, I've just been doing some some editing and monkeying around and just pretty much having fun. That's pretty much it. Trying to figure out the crazy algorithms that's used on YouTube. Oh, right? It, that right there is more work than anything. It's like a mystery. It's yeah, a modern day yeah. digital mystery. Yeah, it is because I this, I think they constantly change it. Actually, I don't think they change it at all. I think they do it just to keep you guessing and say it's all out there crazy, and they just they just like messing with people. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know that uh, what's his name that got in trouble for his video recently. What's his name? Uh, Logan Paul. Yeah, yeah. There you go. I'm like, um, I don't remember that guy. You yeah. know, it's a different world out there. I had no idea the amount of money that guy was generating. I didn't even know who he was until well, remember I, you and I. I was like, who is it? You're like, I have no clue. We had to look him up because I'm like, I don't even know who that guy is. Yeah, right. Well, apparently, a, a large following uh, was mostly children, like ten to twelve year olds. Oh, I, I guess gotcha. he just does goofy stuff on there. I got gotcha. you. Uh, and apparently, got out of control. But uh, that guy was raking in hundreds. Uh, I think I think I heard eight hundred thousand a month. Goodness. Off of YouTube, we make zero off YouTube. Zero. <laughs> Zero dollars. Right? It I, cost me to put videos on YouTube. No, one of the many people ask all the time, you don't monetize YouTube. I'm like, no, because then you can't, you can't use the Pretty Lights music and things like that. It just becomes a whole... And I really don't know how, so... <laughs> well, no, you can... I remember you could you can click into it. But Probably You gotta go button. through all the same thing. Same yeah. thing with Spotify. They start picking you apart. I mean, like, I remember saying, like, look, I've got emails here saying that we have yeah. permission to use this music, but it wasn't good enough for them. So, you know, yeah. it is what it is. Yeah, I'm not worried about but, it. But uh, moving on, I've just got uh, a normal work week. I'm trying to get ready for our vacation. So I'm, I've got a pretty easy week. You don't I've, have longer. What do we got? Three weeks? Three weeks. But man, Whoa. I've been procrastinating. I got to get this um, continuing education stuff done. <laughs> My license expires at the end of March and I'd like to have it sent in. Well, I told myself in December that I guarantee I'm going to have it finished at least a month in advance. Like I want to have it done by January 1st. Well, as you can see, that's come and gone. I haven't messed with it. <clears throat> now, February 1st is approaching and I haven't started it. This is what always happens. And I tell myself every time. Didn't I'm you not do this do the last time I remember talking? Time. You did it. You 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 just had to grind it out. Just like if you've been following uh, expect this expected for the last since we started almost five years ago, then yeah, I'm sure you've heard me complain about this numerous times. But it's it's here upon us again. And the reason I don't hate it, it's not hard or anything. It's just god awful boring. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Like to learn to take courses on something you've been doing for almost twenty years. I'm like, I don't need to know this. Unless something drastic has changed, I don't really need to know. And nothing really drastic has changed. So it's just mind-numbing. 
It it's is boring. Awful. Yeah, it is an and that's, awful thing. And that's the worst part. And I know that anybody that's in college and, or school right now that's listening to this, they know the feeling. Uh, you know, it's a different world out there. Now I've, you can you watch lectures via YouTube <laughs> and videos yeah. and stuff where we had to actually use like actual books. I wonder if they even do that anymore. Does anybody use books or does anybody just have like a, you just download your prospectus and stuff? I, I, I wish I could I mean, tell you. Not your yeah. prospectus. That's like trading. I wish I could tell you, but I have no <laughs> That's idea. A, okay, speaking of that, yeah, like Edward Jones and stuff, they always send me like these prospectuses about my like uh, retirement <clears throat> plans and stocks. I'm like, what? Well, this is like reading hieroglyphics. It means like, nothing to me. Yeah. Isn't this why I pay you? Yeah. <laughs> and if I didn't understand it, I would just be doing the trading myself. Yeah, you're like, I don't know. What are you talking about? Uh, that's because I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, yeah. Let's thank our sponsor real quick, Dollar Shave Club. Get your Dollar Shave Club starter set, which comes with their best razor, along with travel-sized versions of shave butter, body cleanser, and some one-wipe Charlies, all for just $5. But you got to use our code. Just go to dollarshaveclub.com slash expanded. And if you have any stories of your own you'd like to share with me and Cam, you got to email us at expandedperspectives at yahoo.com. You can call the show 817-945-3828. And don't forget, if you like this show, you're only listening to... 50% of it if you're not an elite member. That's right. You got to get elite and you'll get an additional show every week as well as access to the entire back catalog. It's only $5 a month. So you got to go to the website, expandedperspectives.com and click on the elite tab. I hope everybody out there has a good week. Don't work too hard for pretty lights, inner tradition books, new page books, anomalous books, Llewellyn books, and ancient American magazine. I'm Kyle Filson and he's Cam Hale. Peace, y'all.